as the 20th century's economy of scale evolves into a new economy of passion, Adam Davidson, the award-winning founder of NPR's Planet Money podcast and a staff writer at The New Yorker, argues that we have a bright, bright future ahead of us, showing how the last century's economic economy of scale is evolving to accommodate individuals' unique drives, interests, and dilemmas. Writing with his signature mix of hard statistics, lucid explanations, and compelling stories from a wide range of innovators, crusading descendants of sweatshop workers and Amish craftsmen alike, Davidson illuminates an economy that will operate by new rules of intimacy, insight, attention, automation, and passion. Tonight, in conversation, Adam is joined by best-selling author of, most recently, When, Dan Pink. I'm so pleased to welcome Adam Davidson and Dan Pink. Thanks very much. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to Washington, Adam. Thank uh, you. Before, before we begin, uh, thank you all for coming out on a cold and dark and blustery night. Uh, one of the great things about independent bookstores is they offer us a place to go on cold and dark and blustery nights. Um, and so um, I always want to pay tribute at the outset to politics and prose uh, and independent bookstores in general. They are a huge part of the lifeblood of the Washington community. They're enormously valuable for writers like um, Adam and me. And they do great things like this, where you get to hear amazing people like Adam for free. You just come and get a chair. And all your only obligation is to stack the chair against a hard surface when you leave. And buy the book. Oh, and buy the book. Yeah. So um, so big round of applause for politics and prose. Yeah. All right, now on to now now on to Adam Davidson. So Adam Adam is a um, I would describe Adam as irritatingly accomplished, um, really annoyingly accomplished journalist. Um, he covered uh, he was an Iraq War correspondent. Uh, he founded Planet Money. He has uh, covered in some brilliant ways the uh, financial crisis of ten years ago. He was a collaborator on, with Adam McKay on the movie The Big Short. Uh, he was an innovator in podcasts. He writes for The New Yorker. He used to write for the, I mean, you see how irritating it can be. Um, and yet, so here's Adam, this very serious journalist, coming out, Adam, with a book that has a smiley face on it. What's up with that? How'd you come to this? Yeah, well, I, um, uh, had mute on. Okay. Um, I, um, I did, most of my career has been um, horrible, horrible things. And, um, and, Horrible things having to do with the economy. And um, I met my, well, I fell in love with my wife in Iraq and I feel like the financial crisis was great for me. It was great for my career because it was a, a thing to cover even if it was terrible. Um, and throughout all of the coverage of, econo and, and then since the financial crisis, focusing on um, economic inequality, ways in which our economic system uh, is, is creating a lot of pain, I, I began to see things as um, as there, there's the frowny face and the smiley face, and and the idea in this book is an idea that actually ran throughout all of the work I've done, which is that I think, and certainly not just me, um, I see that 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 we are in a period of a dramatic shift from one type of economic system to another type of economic system, and not unlike the shift from an agrarian economy to an industrial economy. And it changes everything. It changes who's winners, who's losers, who are losers, changes politics. If you think of America in the middle of the 19th century, um, where education was only a, a few people had education, um, our political system was very different. The way we thought about families was very different. Um, I think we're going through a change of that magnitude. And those kinds of changes... Um, shake things up in a very dramatic way. And um, and so much of the job of a reporter is to talk about how bad, bad things, it just ends up being what you cover. And, um, but, but throughout, I was noting that there's also opportunity in this change, in this historic change from, in the book I call it the widget economy of the 20th century, where the main thrust of our economy is doing the same thing over and over and over again. And the main function of a person, the way to succeed is to be a good cog in a machine to a new kind of economic system. And, um, and that I kept coming across these people who embodied this idea, um, regular folks, not, not hyper geniuses who became billionaires in Silicon Valley, but regular folks. And I found that 
as important a story to tell about this shift in our economy as as the dark stuff. And, and in some ways, I think it was it was a little bit of a slow hunch because you were keeping a file. I remember in, in the book you described a little bit about that. You were keeping a file, so you're in Iraq, you're covering the war, you're falling in love. Probably not a lot of discretionary time, but still, you're you're keeping a file of things that you're seeing. You're covering the financial crisis, and you're seeing you're keeping a file of, of positive things that you're saying. Yeah, and actually, in Iraq was one of the first places I saw this. I was in Iraq for about a year. I. Uh, the statue fell, if you remember, on a Thursday. I was in Basra in the south, and then I got up to Baghdad that Sunday and spent a year there. And um, But I was there for Marketplace, the public radio business show. So I was covering the business community and, and the American effort to, at the time, they thought, to jumpstart a, um, a, a capitalist economy. But it was the first time where I saw, oh, the rules have completely changed. You know, under Saddam, it was an incredibly centrally controlled economy. It's now, I'm not going to sit here and say it's a good economy now, um, but there was a different type of opportunity. There were different things happening. And I just noted that there were, I, I, I don't, I actually, I told the story in the book and then my editor made me take it out because he thought we don't want Iraq war in this book. Bonus, uh, bonus material, bonus only material here, here. Politics and prose. <laughs> but I just had this very vivid experience where fairly soon after the war, I went to this shoe factory in Baghdad and most factories had been looted, but this factory, a lot of the people worked at this shoe factory. They made like kind of like Crocs looking shoes, uh, mostly for kids. Um, the workers happened to live nearby and they protected the factory. And they had this rule. They weren't going to allow looting, including from themselves. So all the workers, all the factory workers were sitting in the lobby of the building and no one was allowed to see the, the stuff. And I was talking to them and they just kept talking about how they were waiting for an order from the Ministry of Industry. And because in Iraq, it's a centrally controlled economy. It wasn't a market system, just the Ministry of Industry, there was someone whose job it was to say how many children's crocs should be made. And um, and I had just been to the Ministry of Industry. It was gone. It was, it was done. And this metaphor of a room full of people waiting for a fax from the Ministry of Industry just stuck with me as I came back to America. And I felt like so many of us are waiting for that fax from the Ministry of Industry. We're waiting for an economy that works like the economy we were expecting uh, or we were taught to expect um, an economy that thrived in much of the 20th century and realizing, oh, the Ministry of Industry is gone, um, but, uh, but there are possible opportunities. Um, and that's why I'm suggesting people go to Baghdad. It's just a wonderful <laughs> place for entrepreneurship. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, so, so one of the great things about one of the great things about this book, and I think it's a, it draws a contrast between other books in the kind of the business economics genre, is that the storytelling is fabulous, the reporting is outstanding, and one of my favorite stories is the story that Adam that you used to set up the book. Uh, it's a personal story about two Stanleys in your life, and and they end up being almost the um, um, there's almost like a in Washington terms a triangulation. Uh, between the two Stanleys that you're that you're seeing, so tell us about the two Stanleys. Yeah, it's my dad and my grandfather, um, and uh, it was actually throughout writing the book, my wife, who's a wonderful writer and editor named Jen Banbury, um, kept saying, you know, your dad and your grandfather's story is this story. You should write that. And for some reason, I I, I wasn't into it until I was, and then it just felt so perfect. I mean, I as I say in the book, my grandfather Stanley Davidson was. If you just wanted to say, here's what the idealized man of the 20th century, big strapping guy, really looked like Superman, born in 1917, got a factory job making the machines that make ball bearings um, when he was 17 and had his first child on the way and worked for this one company for um, 54 years, I believe, um, and worked for much of that time, worked two shifts a day, all through World War II, worked two shifts a day. He was very embarrassed that he didn't fight overseas, but he would tell anyone who would listen that you can't fight a war without ball bearings. <laughs> and um, and uh, and a very classic, tough, I'm, I'm going to do this job because that's what men do. And um, 
And then he has this son, my dad. And Stanley won, Stanley won look, would have been surprised by this word here on your cover. Yes. Right? And can I, can I read something yeah, yeah, here? Because I love sure. there's so much stuff. Like, this, is a, this is a great book to read aloud. Um, it really is. There's some just some lovely language here. Um, and so yeah, here's, here, I'm reading Adam's work here. Um, did St- about, about passion and whatnot. Did Stanley love ball bearings? Did he have a particular passion about them? No, he most certainly did not. He got the job because his father-in-law knew a guy, and he stayed in the job because that's what you did when you had a job. That's Stanley. <laughs> that was Stanley. But Stanley begat... <laughs> Stanley right. begat Stanley Jr., um, who was, um, for a little kid growing up in the late 30s, early 40s in Worcester, Massachusetts, um, was the exact wrong kid for my grandfather. He was this... <laughs> Um, creative, ex- curious kid who wanted to perform, who wanted to have a very, very different life and began thinking about being an actor. And for a blue collar family from central Massachusetts in the 1940s, this is an, abs- I mean, it, it literally made no sense. He might as well have said he wanted to be a butterfly or something. And, um, and that tension lasted their entire lives. My grandfather softened a bit in his mid nineties, I would say, but um, <laughs> um, he passed away at ninety nine. But um, having promised he'd make it to a hundred his whole life, but he let us down. So um, no, he was a tough, tough guy, and he just saw this as a ridiculous approach to life. But your father was a working actor. My dad was yeah. since I'm almost 50. My since I was one, my dad will proudly tell you he only made money as an actor, which is a hard thing to do. But it's a hard thing to do. He did. We he's not famous. He was a solid working actor in New York City, but um, but we did not. You know, we had very volatile income. And and tell us a little bit about. I think it's quite amazing. Like where you lived as a kid. Yeah, and I think much of this book comes out of, it's it's very much not a memoir, but it comes out of my particular experience. So you have this guy who sees work as sort of a horrible thing you do because that's what you do. And you have my dad who sees work as an expression of who you are and the amount of money you make, or if you put, my dad had great, still, he's still a working actor at 83. He was in a movie with Julia Roberts last year. He was in an episode of Billions last year. Yeah, yeah. Um, And to this day, he's very proud that he showed me that you can have a life of dreams and passion. And I grew up in this house, in this building in Greenwich Village, New York City, that uh, was all artists. You had to be an artist to live there. And if you can imagine Greenwich Village, 1970s, all artist housing, this was a very um, experimental <laughs> world. People were creating a new society, Stonewall, and and everything as a little kid, everyone would talk to you about drugs and sex and every topic you could imagine, except this one horrible topic that was just ugly and awful and no one should talk about it or think about it, which was money and business. <laughs> Um, and, um, and that was something, even as a kid, my rebellion began as I'm going to be a nerdy public radio finance reporter, um, (laughs) that, um, that, that I began to think about, but, but the, that particular background and, and the core lesson of this book, which I like to think I show is true, not just of people named Stanley, but of lots and lots of people is that. I do think that my grandfather was right, that being a dad of a growing family, he did need to work and it would have been irresponsible for him to pursue his passion. And my dad choosing to pursue his passion meant having economic volatility. Um, It always struck me that of card carrying union members, my dad always was in the 99th percentile of income for card carrying union actors. And we did not have a lot of money. I mean, it tells you how, you know, obviously we know about the celebrities, but very, very few actors make a living. And that he was right that that was a choice. But the argument I make in this book is for a whole bunch of things that have changed in our economy, um, it is now possible to do both. You can actually, it's not a guarantee. It's not easy. I'm certainly not selling that. It's not going to happen for everyone. But there is a real possibility to have what I call intimacy at scale or, or a passion business where you do what both my 
Stanley's do. You live a life rooted in your passion, rooted in what you uniquely need and crave, and you can use the tools of the internet and modern economy to match your output to those people who most crave whatever it is you uniquely can do. And I start to feel that it's not just something you can do, it's something you increasingly have to do to thrive. Yeah, and it's it, but it's ultimately a pretty optimistic book, Adam. I mean, one of the things, I'm gonna read, I like reading your stuff. Please. Um, um, you, you say, so many people in the media politics and the general public seem convinced that the American dream has collapsed, that our economy will work only for the very few and the rest are screwed. Well, I disagree. So one of the reasons, let's get into why you, why you disagree, because this is not like, hey, let's talk about Mark Zuckerberg. Let's, not, let's talk about the Airbnb guys. Uh, let's talk about Allbirds, which made the, the almost identical shoes Adam and I are wearing. <laughs> um, uh, instead, you talk about people who um, make brushes. Yeah, I, I very deliberately. Tell, tell, us about, tell yeah. us about that. That's a great story. Yeah, I very deliberately chose people who were not. This is not a book about, um, you know, someone who was born a genius, went to Harvard, then went to Stanford Business School and made their first billion by the time they were 28. This, um, a lot of the people in this book didn't go to college yeah. or they went to colleges you've never heard of, didn't do particularly well. Um, I, 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 I'm a big consumer of business books. I really like your business books, as you know. Um, but I find so many, not yours, are geared towards <laughs> people that they're as if the only people reading business books are going to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company or something. And I just thought that's not where most of us are. Most of us are not thinking um, in that way. Even entrepreneurship. This is most of the people in this book are entrepreneurs technically, but they're doing what uh in Silicon Valley is considered an insult, but I consider a good thing, a lifestyle business. Yeah. Um, they're doing perfectly well. They're, they all have good lives, good economic lives. Um, they have leisure time and big homes and can take nice vacations, but they're not um, in a wild growth path to become billionaires. Anyway, so the brush guy is such a good example because it's, it, it, it's a part of the story of what's happening in America and really is happening all over America and isn't being told. Yeah. So this is another father-son story where um, the Lance Cheney, um, his dad, Max Cheney, ran the family business, Braun Brush, it's in, in Long Island. And they did what a lot of 20th century businesses did. They made brushes. Um, they happened to specialize in brushes for the food industry. So they make, uh, they were very successful with a special brush to clean pizza ovens. Um, it's very bristly, you know, strong bristles, but you don't want those bristles to fall off and get in someone's margarita pie. Um, they make a special brushes to, uh, this is a very specialized kind of brush to rub chocolate and other things on, on uh, candies and pastries. Um, but the core of their business was making lots and lots and lots and lots of brushes and selling as many of them as they can, selling them direct to businesses, selling them in Walmart, et cetera. And then as happens, this, this is the story we all know. China began, companies in China began making brushes and started exporting the brushes. And at first they were crappy brushes and the bristles fell off. And then over time, um, they got better and better and better. And Braun Brush was competing with equally good brushes that cost less fully made than the raw material Braun Brush would need. That's the story we hear all the time. And the next chapter of the story is, and then they went out of business. But, and they were heading there. And Max Cheney, the dad, just was resistant and resistant. And um, eventually Lance took over the company and Lance said, I'm just gonna make a rule. We don't compete with China. Just if China makes a brush, we're not making that brush. And by the way, we're not gonna sell to Walmart. And this to his dad, what are you talking about? They're our number one customer. And he said, yeah, but they're terrible. And we're always going to be in this battle. And what Lance said is, we're not going to make money by the volume of brushes. We're going to have brush related solutions. And I love the simplicity of his business. So if you think of a brush, there's a kind of bristle, there's a kind of stick or handle, and there's something that puts them together, a staple or a glue. And Lance knows this intimately. He can truly talk for hours 
and some of those hours are very interesting. Sometimes it gets a little long winded about he I remember explaining to me why beaver hair is what you want when you're putting oh. chocolate on pastries for reasons to do. But where when horse hair is a better brush, when you want a straw or a Tampico um, and then I'm never eating a chocolate pastry again <laughs> <laughs> with the beaver hair. And so he began thinking about people who might have brush problems, who might not even know they have a brush problem. And his first big success was uh, a nuclear power plant that um, had this problem where there were staples just in the coolant liquid, which you can imagine, we've all seen Chernobyl, I hope, it's a great TV show. You don't want staples in your coolant liquid, lots and lots, like sloshing around, huge, bulky, each staple is small, but bulky metal. For those of you watching at home who are running nuclear reactors. So yeah, yes, exactly, <laughs> yes. Um, and it turned out they were using a brush to clean the pipes that was dropping staples. And so Lance came up with a design um, that, W was basically a staple free brush that could clean the insides of nuclear power plants. Um, you know, the materials are very important, no reactivity, all that stuff. And he told me the material costs about $12. But when you go to a nuclear power plant and say, hey, you know how you're going to kill everybody? I can sell you this thing where you won't kill everybody. You can charge whatever you want. He happened to charge $6,000. He probably could have sold them at 60000 And then he started selling them to other nuclear power plants, other nuclear power plants. Another great one is on Mars. NASA, the rover that went to Mars, does this thing where it goes up to rocks and it does a little procedure on the rocks and it needs to clear debris from the rocks. And, it, and Lance designed a special brush that does that. And you can imagine it has to be extremely light. It costs a lot to ship stuff. It has to be incredibly reliable. It has to, you know, Mars's surface is extremely cold and then extremely hot. Um, and it's still up there. <laughs> you know, it's it, obviously, well, who would go up there to reclaim a brush? It that wouldn't make any sense. That was a stupid yeah. point. But, um, and what Lance has done, he's become this brush solution <laughs> genius. Yeah. He created a special brush for Lay's potato chips because they had this machine where the potato chips were getting all messed up in a corner of the machine. But where I find that very inspirational is there's, there's topics we might know where we're able to combine um, a solution mindset, deep knowledge of some arcane thing, and just a curiosity and a hunger to solve problems. And that is what I'm talking about. This is not all about either Etsy or creating um, you know, a, a massive, I mean, Albert's by the standards of Lance is a massive consumer success. Oh yeah. 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 And so what, what's great about this is that these are um, uh, companies that are and entrepreneurs that are really beneath the, the radar. At some level, I just thought about this. I, I don't know any of you, I'm, I'm sure that they were here. Uh, James Fallows and his wife, uh, Deborah Fallows um, wrote a book. I can't remember the name of it. Sorry. The, the De Deborah Fallows. And uh, anyway, uh, it's a terrific book. Yeah. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, where they uh, they're both journalists and they took they and and, J and Jim Fallows is a pilot and they he traveled they traveled around basically to what people on the East Coast uh, derisively call kind of flyover country and found that there's all these great things happening out there in the, you know away from the coast and and there's some remarkable things there now well, the other thing I like about this is that not only is that like a totally interesting story and you have this this interesting father and son dynamic you know you end up knowing a huge amount about brushes but you derive some lessons from these that we can apply in our own work what's a lesson that we can derive from uh, Lance and the brush business so I, I think there's a a few lessons one is the just don't be in this commodity business I mean I think that a way to understand the difference in this economy today from the 20th century economy is the, the 20th century economy was a commodity economy, a bulk goods economy, which was a revolution in the world, right? The, before, say, 1860, almost all the material goods that anybody would interact in their life were made either by themselves or the family member or someone nearby, you know, you knew the names of the grandparents of everyone who made everything you own. There was a small number, as you know, of high value luxury goods that it, that have been traded from neo, pre-Neolithic times. But for the vast majority of material stuff, it was just made locally, intimately, but not with any scale. There was no way for a baker in, 
um, ancient Assyria or medieval France to say, hey, I got this new angle on bread. I know nobody around here wants it, but I bet there's enough people around the world that I could get a business going selling it around the world. That just couldn't happen. Then we have this th new thing called you know, trains and, and the global supply chain. And you have this new problem that had never existed, trust at a distance. I walk into a general store and suddenly there's soap and food products and even homes, pre-built homes made by people I've, I'll never meet, living in a place I'll never go. And how do I feel good about that? How do I trust that? And we solved that with a bunch of solutions. Brands was a big solution. We eventually, it took a long time, got food safety laws. And, um, and what that whole commodity economy was built around was this mass rep repetition, this constant, constant repetition. I think what, what Lance teaches, uh, and, and for most of the period from say 1880 to 1980, to do that, if you ran Procter & Gamble or you ran um, a big oil company or whatever it is, you needed a lot of people involved. If you think of Mad Men and you think of all the drafts people and secretaries and accountants and bookkeepers, it just, you had to pay a lot of people and you actually had to pay them a decent wage. Scale is going to be scalier than ever. We're, there's going to be big companies making more stuff, more quickly, more cheaply, more, spread it more all over the world. They just don't need us anymore. And or they need far fewer of us. And they, they have far more bargaining power than the workers do. And so the Lance lesson of just saying, oh, I'm leaving that thing. I'm doing this other thing is a really sharp lesson. As I say, it's not the path to being a billionaire, but it is the path to being having several hundred thousand. It's a path to being a millionaire. It's a path to having a comfortable life. You know, running a business that does that that employs I don't remember how many people they employ, but that employs that employs people, that puts a great product on the market, that that supports their family. I mean, it's it's I think it's a inspiring story. Let's want to there, there are a lot of great stories like this. I want to open it up for questions here in a moment. I want to move to to white collar because uh, this book contains something that um I actually never thought was possible, which is, and I'm going to say this, a phrase that I've never heard, even imagined uttering before, but there is a riveting chapter about accounting in this. <laughs> I mean, truly. I mean that very seriously. I told Adam uh, beforehand, I go, oh, like, the accounting, like, I have a little star by right here. The accounting <laughs> chapter is my favorite chapter. Um, but it's, it's, it's a brilliant um, uh, bit of storytelling with some good lessons. Tell us about um, the accountant who decided to sort of Put, a, put her thumb his nose at the accounting profession and do it by assembling like a Justice League of America. Oh, you said Ocean's Eleven. Yeah. An Ocean's Eleven group of uh, conspirators. Yeah. And uh, I, I have to be careful here because I could truly talk about accounting for hours, which I never thought I'd find interesting, but it's fascinating. I'm there. I got all the yeah, I got all yeah, right yeah, at yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and the accounting, it turns out, may be more important than any individual, than, you know, the steam engine or rail in in creating the modern world. That um, when when you understand the challenges that businesses had um, in in creating the modern economy, accounting. Uh, the example I love is Robert Lowell and the Waltham uh, production system. So this is the first uh, multi-stage process factory, vertically integrated factory. So for all of the early stage of the Industrial Revolution in England and in New England, that we had the cottage system where every business person was doing one thing. So they were shearing sheep, and then someone else was taking the the wool and spinning it. And then someone else was taking the spun wool and and putting it on a loom and, and creating a textile. And then someone else was cutting the textile. Someone else was sewing it into clothes. And that actually contains its own accounting because... I buy something for this much, I sell it for that much, and so that I know how much I made. And then, and that is how all business was conducted for all of human history, when business was conducted, which is not all of human history. But anyway, um, and so then we have a multi-stage process. I buy a bunch of wool, I, at the end of this seven-stage process, I have finished garments, but I don't know where I'm losing money or making money. Um, because there's seven steps. I could be buying it for a buck, selling it for two bucks, and losing my shirt. So there was also a highly technical 
mechanical problem where they had one giant water wheel and using leather belts, they had to run seven different machines running at different um, speeds. That took a year. The accounting took a decade to figure out and was even harder because Robert Lowell was very sick and couldn't travel the 25 miles from his home to the factory. So he had to come up with numbers that would allow him and to, to do this work. And you see this again and again. If you hear about DuPont Chemical, why, why did DuPont become the first modern corporation? And then its learnings then when DuPont bought GM, GM really created what we think of as the modern, it was all accounting. Um, and But then accounting fell into something a lot like what the brush business fell into. It stopped solving problems and became about compliance and audits, et cetera. And so this, I love this character, Jason Blummer, a truly shitty accountant by his own, it took him six tries to pass his right. CPA exam. He didn't know what an accountant was when he started majoring in accounting. It, his dad was an accountant, but never happened to mention what an accountant was. And so when he had to declare a major, he thought, oh, I guess that's what you declare. Um, and, but he started thinking about the fact that his customers didn't want what he did. They don't want, no one wants an audit. Nobody wants to pay their taxes. And he just started, and he was a broke guy. He made like 60 grand a year, which is not terrible, but he had a big family. And he was, he was living in South Carolina. In South yeah. Carolina. And he hated every day of his job and he felt like everyone hated him. And he just started asking this question, what would it be like if my customers were excited about me and excited about what I'm doing and would pay me money for happily. And he, it, it, it's a long story and that's why you should buy the book, but it, um, it's, a very, it's an excellent story too. But he, and he took a lot, of, it took him a long time to figure it out. But what he figured out that there is this whole class of people who are people like other people in my book, creative people, passionate people who don't know how to match their passion with their money and know how to do it in a way where they're not going to lose money. Um, and uh, I think of my wife who had a small business many years ago making cards, like very beautiful cards. And it took her about a year to realize that she was selling the cards for considerably less than the raw material to make them. And she couldn't make it up in volume. And so, <laughs> and so while, you know, Starbucks isn't going to hire Jason Blummer to, to do their books. He's not that kind of accountant. If any of you are looking for somebody, um, because, and by the way, I've hired him. I wrote about him and then I hired him. He's now my um, advisor and accountant. Uh, and I pay him a lot of money and I'm happy to pay him a lot of money. And I'm excited to talk to him each and every time. And that is something that keeps coming up in the brush business and so in the Amish, where there was a period of real creative excitement in the past, a period of kind of commodification, and now finding these people who are exploding with passion and excitement. And one of the ways that he decommoditized himself was by getting rid of billing by the hour. Yes, and I know this is an obsession of yours. It's yeah. become an obsession of mine. Um, I mean, he gets almost religious about it that... Um, I mean, and it gets to the core of it. No, no, no one in this room has ever said, you know what I'd like an hour and 15 minutes of an accountant's time. I think, um, and when you build, and another major lesson that I think he provides, Lance Cheney provides is, I think we have a pricing crisis yeah. in America that, that we're pricing based on um, a commodity market view of the world where there's you know, supply and demand and you price at what economists call the point of indifference, where the least interested buyers like, yeah, fine, okay, I'll buy it. And what Blummer's trying to do, what Lance is trying to do, what I recommend more people do is don't, don't price there, price at the point of maximum excitement. And when you commodify. So what Jason can do, like so many of us can do in our fields, is in the initial consultation, he might have some insights that take him, it's, it's not connected to time. The value is not connected to time. Maybe it's 10 minutes, maybe it's a day, but there's going to be an initial burst of value that might, I can say in my life, has had hundreds of thousands of dollars of value on my business. And then there's a lot of boring stuff that has to happen, a lot of entering data and spreadsheets. And they're not equal. And you shouldn't, if you price based on the billable hour, or you price based on the cost of the brush 
materials that you made, you're not, it's not just that you're, you're losing, the customer's losing because people aren't going to make that thing if, if it, Jason Blummer is not going to spend a decade figuring out, well, he will because he just wanted to, but most, few, too few people will spend the time to figure out how to truly add that massive value if they're just, if they're going to make the same amount of money if they just do the commodity boring work. And in my view, this applies to lawyers, it applies to architects, it applies to everything. Yeah, yeah and it's one of the lessons of the book. And, and Adam comes up with uh, eight rules of the economy. One, rule number three is the price you charge should match the value you provide, which sort of in some ways runs slightly counter to sort of certain thinking in microeconomics about the price you should charge has to go to the inputs that it took to fashion the goods or goods or services. Uh, there are eight rules, eight great rules in this book. Let's talk about one more. Somebody pick a number between one and eight that's not three. <laughs> six. six, great. You'll learn something from every rule here. Number six, number six. You probably have it memorized, I don't. Number six, number six, number six. Oh, it's a good one. And this underlying story on this is great. Uh, rule number six, technology should always support your business, not drive it. And so for that, you want to talk uh, one last story and we'll take some questions on, um, again, my second favorite chapter after the accounting is the one about the Amish family that makes plows. Yes. And I do want to say on rules and stuff, I yeah. will just flatter you, yeah. say to you, while I was writing this, like Dan f writes a lot of really great books and I, f I just kept wishing I had your skill at laying out arguments in that uh, with the clarity you do. This book is very good. You should buy very my good. book yeah. first and yeah. then get his yeah. books. But um, <laughs> but I really was thinking of you while wow. very much while I was um, writing that section. So um, th sometimes there's just an example that just gives itself to you so much so that you feel like you invented it and um, uh, that you made it up, which I did not. This book was fact-checked by a very good fact-checker. Um, so this idea is, uh, well, I... I I remember talking to an Amish woman who told me and my wife, you think we're simple because you think we just reject everything. But that's not true. We think about everything and we make a decision about everything. You're simple because you just take whatever comes and you just chase whatever is new. And that is very, very true. <laughs> and um, and so I, I do think, obviously, there's a place in our economy for people who really are going to be on the bleeding edge of technology and are going to figure out how to what the next le next next thing is. But I think for the vast majority of businesses, technology is a tool. It, it, this feels like a fairly trite and obvious point, and it's only valuable to the extent that it's valuable and should not drive how you think about your business. And so, almost as if created to prove this point, is Pioneer Equipment. It's this the Wengert family in Dalton, Ohio, not far from where you grew up, that uh, makes plows and other farm equipment for other, for farmers like the Amish who uh, farm by horse. Um, and it's, when you first go there, it, you feel like you're in the 19th century. It's all these Amish guys with beards and they show up on horse, in carriages. There's very, they're, they do have a small amount of electricity. They have a handful of flip phones that they allow their salesmen to use sometimes, but but it's very little technology, very little in the way of modern technology. Yet, as you get to know this company, they are using mostly through outside contractors all of the modern tools. They're using um, Excel O. Oh, what is it called? Uh, XPO Logistics, the massive logistics company, because they have this big problem of getting these bulky farm equipment from their rural factory to rural Amish communities spread all over the world. That turns out to be a very complicated problem that a lot of technology can solve. They don't have to be experts in it. They just use that company. They use really advanced metals to make, you know, we were joking earlier that you'd think at this point, what's more to be invented in plows? Plows have been around for thousands of years. But these, are, these, aren't, like, these aren't plows. These are non-motorized. Equipment. Equipment, this is, yeah. This is non-motorized farm equipment, something I've never said out loud before. But this is, <laughs> but you, but this is amazing. This is like animal-powered plows. 
That's and amazing. right, you would think that was perfected. But every year they're coming out with new things and they're doing the same stuff Lance Cheney does. They're staying in touch with their consumer. They're thinking creatively about the problems they have. But then they're also living in this ecosystem. So they have a metals supplier. They don't know much about metallurgy, but they're able to use the advances that the auto industry has made in really strong but really light steel to make plows that can do things no plow ever did before. And so, so for me, they're... they're further proof that we have the technology. It's all around us. I'm not, and I'm not saying we should all become Amish or anything like that, but that the, the core is what is the thing that you know, what is that customer you're connecting with, and what's the technology that allows you to create that value that you can then price, not, oh, God, we got to have an app, we got to have, you know. Yeah, and what I, what I love about this is that I think I'm trying to find it in here where your, your character... Um, uh, the I can't think of his first name. Um, that the pioneer guy uh, says that he's gonna, he's going to make the iPhone of non motorized farm equipment. <laughs> yeah, yes. But he doesn't have an iPhone. Right. He doesn't <laughs> have an iPhone. <laughs> yes. Right. He's played around with a friend. So it's yeah. So it's all. <laughs> this book is full of all kinds of great, really like delicious, great storytelling. Some really really interesting characters, people you haven't read about before. All of which. I, I think built to some really powerful lessons that I know that I can use in my own business and a lot of you will use. Let's go to the, uh, take some questions from you all. Um, if you could please go to the microphone over there to where I'm, where I'm pointing. Uh, if you have a question for Adam um, it, about uh, this or, or, I mean, Adam's overall, I mean, Adam actually has also, if you're interested, uh, Adam has written in the New Yorker about actually a, a pretty urgent and timely issue having to do with um, Iran and money laundering and, the President of the United States. So if you want to ask about that, <laughs> go for it. Yes, sir. Hi, Adam. Uh, enjoy your columns in the in the New Yorker. And I uh, just wanted to ask uh, the passion economy and social media. I think you tweet, uh, and I think that's led me to several of your articles. There's some virtue in that. But do most of the people that you talk about in this book, are they on social media? Are they using that to sort of uh, elevate the, the, the price value of their passion? Yeah, I'd, I'd say I, I think a lot about social media, um, more so since the day David Remnick gave me a lecture about how badly I'm using it, because um, it <laughs> turns out getting in fights with Maggie Haberman on Twitter is a bad idea. Um, but um, so, yes, I, I definitely think social media is, has, has problematic uses. Some of the people use it aggressively. In fact, Jason Blummer, the accountant, really formulated his idea. There's a whole accountant Twitter thing that's going on where people are really discussing the essence of accounting in, in really interesting ways in Twitter. And I see it more in that way where there's a conversation going on than just like a promotional tool. That That's where some of the people in this book have really used social media intelligently. But now that you mention it, because I hadn't thought about that, very few of them are using it. And I'm trying to think, I don't think I have a fundamental view. I mean, I think it, like anything, it's a tool that can be used. The Amish are not using it particularly <laughs> aggressively. Um, yeah. So how do they? Yeah. So the question from from there is so how how then do they elevate the value of what they're doing without publicizing it? I guess through that particular channel. Yeah. Right. So so uh, I do think that um, one of the radical changes that has created this economy is digital technology that allows for that immediate um, connection between and and the, in a sense the Amish while they don't tweet. They do have distributors spread all over the world. You know, Amish are in 31 states. They tend to be in very remote areas. And they're not using stuff all the time, but they will use email. They use email. Um, there's a Amish tech show. And literally, no joke, they co the computer companies compete for how little their computer does. We don't have any pictures. We don't have any video. We don't. And um, But they do have email. And I can tell you from my own frustration, um, they don't respond very quickly. It might be a few days. Um, but they are able to communicate with their consumer through digital tools, even if it's not with the urgency that we have. And yes, every single person in this book is using digital, no question, using digital tools. I think we're very early days in the development of 
digital marketplaces. I had a really interesting talk yesterday with a smart techno futurist um, about how um, it, it's looking like we're going to have lots of marketplaces. It's not just going to be Amazon or eBay, that there's going to be a lot of customized marketplaces. That guy, Jason Blummer, created his own digital place for actually, well, I think it's like 80 ac accountants, but it's very valuable for them to just communicate. So yes, digital tools, Twitter threw me off a little because I have, we all have complex feelings about Twitter, but digital tools are absolutely essential. And, and Blummer, the accountant had a, a podcast talking about, I, I mean, I think in some ways there's a, what, one of the things that you show here is are the returns to expertise, uh, being extremely expert in something that even if it's, if it's relatively narrow and you have a lot of channels now to sort of prof to profess your expertise. And Blummer, the accountant, had a podcast on accounting, and he got one of his clients and another character in your book because she listened to the podcast yeah. and thought the same thing that Adam thought. is like, oh, my God, I want this guy as my accountant. And that's another thing I'm seeing that I think is really good. I see it in a lot of fields, which is like these affinity groups. So Blummer, they call themselves cliff jumpers. Um, because they're accountants who've jumped off the cliff of 20th century accounting. Um, and I actually wanted to call the book Cliff Jumpers, but my publisher thought that would confuse everybody for about what it's about. But it's just this affinity group. You don't have, it's not like going to an Ivy League school, but it is a mark, it's a credential. It's a, it's, it, you don't have to take a test. It's just, if you're part of that community, you know. And I will tell you now, I'm only gonna work with Cliff Jumpers as my accountants, just because I like their approach, I know their approach. If someone's in that group, they've spent enough time thinking about it. And and so I, I think we're in the very early stages of the kind of digital tools that will allow for this to happen. I think it's still way too hard to match your passion with someone else's passion. It's it's There's a lot of hassle. Interesting, let's go to the next one. Hey, thanks. Um, I was curious about your thoughts on whether there's enough space in this new passion economy, I'm thinking about like um, middle America, you mentioned it earlier, like there's opportunities to, you know, for people out in wherever to do something innovative and small, even though Amazon isn't moving to, you know, Alabama or whatever. Um, but it seems like that's around the margins. And you, when you look at most of our, you know, rural or small town or small city areas, you see stagnation or worse. And so this sort of, you know, catering to sort of wealthy people who can afford an accountant, you know, I mean, like, that's still pretty wealthy, right? Or this or that specialized product or Amish furniture. That sounds really nice. But what about for like, people who aren't the quickest on the draw, they were just born where they maybe they're more focused on their family or their community or, or whatever. Is there space in that for you? I mean, like zooming out from your vision? How does that work for at scale? Yeah. So first of all, I would say there's definitely losers in this economy and there might be a lot of losers in this economy. Um, the 20th century economy, probably more than any other time in human history, was a good economy for, um, you know, almost every group grew. And, you know, I think of my dad's youngest brother who was developmentally disabled and for much of his life he could have work in a textile business because factories needed somebody to sweep the floors and move boxes. And that, for a whole host of reasons, we don't have much to offer a lot of people in this economy. And this is definitely, this book is not me saying, problem solved, everything's great, there's no problems. And this is, I chose to make this not a political book, um, you know, my politics would say that we do need a much stronger safety net for the people who aren't going to thrive in the 21st century. Um, so I, this is not a, this is good for everybody or er, problem solved. I don't believe that. I do, however, believe that this is not about wealthy consumption. I think it's easy to think that because that is what we see so much. Um, Amish farmers are very poor. The average Amish family makes $30,000 a year or so. And, um, and many of the people in this book are making products or providing services um, for poor people. In fact, I wanted to do it in this book, but for various reasons we didn't. Probably the single most exciting thing is Africa and Asia um, and South America where you know, even not particularly advanced smartphones will allow for a whole new types of marketplaces. So I do think it, it's not income 
I think there are a lot of products and services and ways of doing it at every income level. But I do think it requires, as, as, you know, as you said, a bit of curiosity, a bit of passion, a bit of um, hunger. And it probably requires some amount of capital. That doesn't mean millions. It might mean, but it means not being, you know, if you're my grandfather and you're working two shifts a day and you're completely exhausted, you're not going to be able to do this. So, um, so does it, all, it also requires, though, I mean, here we are in, in Washington, you know, the seat of supposedly the seat of, of public policy and things. It, you know, these people, human being, Americans, like, we don't operate in a, in a complete vacuum. We operate in a context, a context where so maybe, you know, we're like it's, it's harder to do any of these things if you don't have good schools. Um, it's hard to do any things if it, these kinds of things, certainly the industrial stuff, if there's not a robust infrastructure. And so I th would think that that becomes, you know, there's a public policy challenge. You don't write about it, but how do, what are the proper policies to support that? Let me ask you a quick question on that before we go to the next one. Uh, would you be for something like the universal basic income? I, I think something like the universal as a, as basic income. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think broadly speaking, if, if this is getting on the dark side as well, the frowny face of the smiley face. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I do see us as in a fundamental shift and fundamental shifts, uh, you know, th th there are losers and, 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 um, and I think w we pay a lot of attention, rightfully so, to the rising inequality among the 0.01% and the wild shift in wealth towards the very, very rich. There's also a shift in wealth towards people with education, like the top 20%, people who've gone to decent colleges, not necessarily Ivy League, but decent colleges who, you know, probably a lot of people who, who would shop in a place like this. And, and, um, and that there's been very little economic growth, rather famously, among the bottom 80%. That's a lot. <laughs> that turns out 80% is a lot of the po population. And so I, 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 I don't see, and I don't know any economists or thoughtful people who see uh, a, a, a scenario in which we don't, there's, we're, we're, that inequality is just going to stop growing. So yes, I think that, and, and then on top of it, for the things I want to see, robust education, particularly, you know, uh, for uh, throughout, for communities that are underserved now, and I'm, all the basic infrastructure, road and internet and all of that, the more broadly shared they are, the, 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 um, it, the more essential. So um, there's a huge public policy dimension to this story. And obviously right now at this moment doesn't, I, I don't have a lot of reason to feel optimistic, but um, often these dramatic changes require, you know, it takes generations to solve the problems. So hopefully we will. Let's go to the next one. Uh, I have a unique perspective on the idea of the passion economy. About two years ago, my mother started declining with dementia. I was a low wage earner, minimum wage jobs, not much better than that. So I basically quit my work and I stayed home, took care of her, and I got back into my passion of woodworking. Mm. It killed time. It kept me from going nuts. And uh, But I discovered something about this age that you're talking about, this change that we're going through. It's sort of like a new gold rush, and that doesn't, that's not a positive thing. Um, the people who are making the money right now seem to be the people who are selling the picks and the axes and the shovels and everything like that. Um, I've had terrible experiences with the fact that everybody wants to get into the game. Um, people underprice their work, like your wife did with the cards. Uh, not realizing their value. So you're going out there, you're trying to tell people, well, yes, there's a difference between what I make and what they make. Um, but the reality of it is there's many people out there who have a, a wage earning job and they're trying to break into this idea of the passion economy. And one of the horrible entities that I, I think of is Etsy. Etsy itself, on the average item I sell on Etsy, I pay between 12 to 17 percent, depending on what the shipping is, in fees paid out to Etsy on everything I sell. And that's a huge amount. And um, they seem to be making money at it, and they don't quite fit the bill. They're basically, they are selling mass consumer-produced items, and nobody seems to realize it. So you, you've got all this, all these people who want to, you know, go out to the stream and start panning for gold. And um, there's just 
too many people out there. It seems sometimes. So you, so you think? So the, I guess the the, the question is: um, Are there too many people tasting too, too few opportunities? And that's one of them. And are certain of these platforms that might enable the the, the passion economy? Are they um, extracting rents that are unfair? Yeah, well, and that that I mentioned this conversation I had with this VC, the venture capitalist, about these marketplaces, and it was specifically about that idea. Like I find, because I go on Etsy, it's not very good at, in my experience of matching what I want with a producer. And I've bought, I like, you know, I'm a writer, so I like, they, they sell nice pens and inks and notebooks. And I find like, I'm, I just end up buying something that came from China and isn't that well made. And, and, and to me, that's a failure. That's not, that's a failure for me. And it's a failure for you, the person who's creating the, the product. I, I do think there are other places I can go. There are retail outlets. You can make the choice to, you know, Jason Blummer has this saying that you truly can never niche too narrowly. That, um, that you know, the, the ultimate niche is where you don't even have to sell to the people because they already know that you're the only one who does the thing they want you to do. Um, I do think that the specific area of crafts is really, really tough. And it's, and it's tough for a whole bunch of reasons, one of which is there's people like you who like doing it. And when part of the payment is just the fun of doing it, you're just always going to have people who are undercharging because it's, they're not making a business decision. And that's just a tough field to be in. So I feel like if I were working with you or if Jason Blummer were working with you, there'd be some time. And by the way, it might take a year. It might take five years. It's not, I'm not saying it would be a phone call to figure out, well, what is it that you do? What are the people, who's out there who most wants that thing? Um, and then, um, and then how do we match you to that group at that willingness? I feel like there's zero chance Etsy would be what would come out of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And one of the rules uh, of the eight rules is fewer passionate customers are better than a lot of indifferent ones. Yeah. Uh, and I think that ends up being um, a big, a big lesson. It's a great case study of these uh, fascinating, uh, these two, two women, a couple uh, who started a line of clothing for women who want to wear more kind of like menswear. Um, and, you know, that's, that's not um, um, Macy's. Yeah. Uh, that's. Uh, you know, but if you if you if you if you're a woman who wants menswear, they're the go to person now. So, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I was curious. So you're talking about the 20th century employment model and breaking into the passion economy. It seems like the biggest constraint, perhaps from a public policy perspective, is employee based or employer based uh, health insurance. If you could elaborate on that. Yeah, it's a disaster. <laughs> it's like the dumbest thing. It would be hard to imagine a worse idea, if, particularly for the things I care about. If, if what you're saying is pursue your passion, but if you don't want to die, it's just going to be a huge hassle. I mean, it's a crazy, insane nightmare. Um, and, and that's where, you know, you, you think of institutional response. There's a book that I found very influential, Why Nations Fail by Daron Ajamolu and, and Jim Robertson, um, I'm sure it's available here, although buy my book first, um, uh, that um, ex explains how institutions respond to massive changes throughout economic history. There's no one that needs to change more than this. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I was a consumer of Obamacare for a period, and it's not sufficient, but the idea that we would go backwards is insane. It's, it's a crazy idea. So one last question as we wrap up. So Adam um, is not only a writer, but he has become recently a CEO. Um, so you started your own company. Um, tell us a little bit about that and tell us about how you're applying the lessons you've learned by traveling the country to um, the, t the hard task of running a company. Sure, and then we'll wrap up because yeah. I want I, I want to um, end on a up note. So um, I mean, writing this book, I was thinking a lot about my own career, and I, I think of my career from radio to podcasting as as just a clear example of what I'm talking about. I was at NPR for a long, long time, and not I, well. I love NPR. I assume I love NPR, but um, it's a broadcast product. It's a it's a, a 
you know, it, it's designed, I, I think we all know that feeling, you, you go to a new city, you rent a car, you turn the dial, you know where you're on the NPR station the second you hear the first semi-syllable, because there's just a way of talking. And, and, and that's by design, that there's a way of, you know, we're creating a show, it's going to appeal to people, 80-year-olds in Alabama and 25-year-olds in San Francisco, and the, it's built around the three to four minute radio piece. Um, I'm a strong believer that there's literally nothing you want to know that is best told in three to four minutes. You either want 30 seconds or you want like 20 minutes or two hours, but you nothing. And, but that's a kind of bargain. Like, hey, we're going to broadcast to everyone. If you're really into it, great. If you're not, don't worry. Something else is coming in five minutes, in three minutes. And then um, we suddenly, very suddenly, had podcasting. And we're, we're actually no longer... It's me talking to a microphone at um, NPR headquarters, and that's going out to 30 million people It's who are passively listening. It's me doing a show, and then people have a lot of shows they can choose from, and they're actively picking. And I remember when we started Planet Money, when we got to 50,000 listeners, which today is would be considered a failing podcast, but at the time was insane in 2008. We were so successful. But People at NPR, you get 30 million on Morning Edition. Why are you messing around 50,000? But I would get, I'd say in all my years in public radio, maybe I got two letters. I don't remember ever getting an email. With Planet with plan Money, we couldn't keep up with the inflow. You know, that you just felt the energy of those 50,000. And and actually, it's monetizable. The It's, it's a boring, it's a, but the way you sell ads is, is called CPM. Um, cost per thousand listeners. And it's like $2 for radio and $80 for podcasting. It's a huge difference because there's a level of engagement and excitement. And so I began applying these ideas in a small business I was starting. And then I hooked up with Sony Music, which to my surprise really has adjusted itself. It used to see itself really as capturing value, that it stood between listeners and musicians and they got to charge a toll and they realized, oh, no one needs us anymore. <laughs> We're useless. How can we become useful? And they said, okay, our business now is serving artists. We're just going to focus on helping artists do their best work. And then listeners will want that. And someone else, Spotify, Apple, will figure out how to make money off the listeners. But we're going to be so supportive of the artists. Um, and so we've created a company together, me and my partner, Laura Marin, and Sony called Three Uncanny Four, that's a podcast production company where we are using the principles of this book also on our employees as well and, and arguing that having our own staff kind of on their own passion journey. So we have, I think, we just hired a few people. I think about 15 people will probably double fairly quickly. And what we're doing is everybody is on their journey. And the goal is in over you know, people have to do their job and we're not just letting everyone run around, pursue their passion, but, um, but everyone is on a path to refine and harness and, and drive their, um, their own personal ability to exercise their passion in a way that is also makes money and, and, and promotes the business. Now we're six months old. Um, we haven't actually sold anything yet. So, um, so we may fail horribly, but right now I feel like it's working really, really well. Well, well, we wish you, we wish you good luck. Uh, this is, uh, just eminently readable. Uh, just, it's a really a joy to read, which you don't say about most business books. It's a, it's a joy to read all kinds of great lessons. Uh, I, I, um, sent a copy to my 23 year old who is about to enter the workplace. So, um, let's, Hope you pick up a copy, but for now, give a big round of applause to Adam Davidson. Thank you, Dan.